The subject of death and dying has many different dimensions to it, um, which we, you know, we're going to just try to sort of touch on some of it. It's impossible to touch on all of anything. I, I, the purpose of these classes is to open a window or open a doorway and give you an idea of what's on the other side of the garden um, that you can then follow through either by following through with Ananda, with the things I've done, with other spiritual paths, but just to uh, give you an idea of how to orient. So that's how I have to relax in my own heart and say we can only cover so much material. Okay, so the, the idea of death, as we're talking about it today, has several things that we need to come into uh, group understanding about. And uh, the book that I held up earlier that I said is really a book about death is actually titled Karma and Reincarnation. It was actually a marketing decision not to put the word death in the title. I strongly advocated the word death. Some people thought death was kind of a downer and it wouldn't sell, so they just called it Karma and Reincarnation. But Karma and Reincarnation is really the essence of what the experience of death is about. So I'm going to start there because the, the, the positive relationship that we have toward death is the very simple understanding that death is only of the physical body. And at first that may seem like a big deal, like, oh, it's the physical body. But the perspective that we need to start with is that it is only the physical body. And if it's only the physical body, that means that this pronoun, I, has many dimensions to it other than what we commonly think about it. Um, when we do interpretations on the Bible, the whole understanding of the Bible has to do with the pronoun I. What did Jesus mean when he said I? When Jesus said I, according to the way other masters interpret the teachings of Jesus, he meant I, the infinite spirit. And he was a fully self-realized master. He was a fully enlightened being. He understood that living in this body was just a little window for the infinite spirit. Now, this is the same for all of us. All of us are just a little window onto the infinite that's coming through these physical bodies. The difference between most of us, I'm not going to universally include all of you, I'll just speak of myself, and the masters on the altar, is that they live in the physical body, but don't forget their unity with the infinite. Whereas I'm living in the physical body and I'm not aware simultaneously of infinity. I used to do a little bit of acting. It was the only thing that ever interested me before the spiritual path. I stopped before I was 20, but I had enough fun doing it that I remember what it was like. You get into a costume. Um, I got to play Gwendolyn and the importance of being earnest once, and I had this big uh, lavender hat and this beautiful lavender organza gown, and makeup artists worked on me for a long time and I was very beautiful and I got to just go around like this and I completely forgot when I was on that stage that I had any other reality. I mean not every minute of it because I wasn't that good but every so often I would just become this young British woman in this farce with this lavender hat on and the life that I lived outside of it was just forgotten. Um, in our uh, elementary school we teach children a lot through theater. When you watch the movie tonight, it'll go by literally in just a few seconds, but you'll see some very beautiful children's theater being acted out, and that, that's all happening in the school in Palo Alto that I'm part of, that pa uh, Brian was actually a founding child, and he graduated from that school. Um, but we use theater to teach the children, and every year we do a, a major theater production on the life of some great soul. We've done it on Hafiz, on the Dalai Lama, on Yogananda, on Jesus, on St. Francis, on Joan of Arc, um, Krishna, uh, Mirabai, we just all these different figures. And over the years, all the children in the school are in it, and they act out the parts of these great souls, and they really understand their lives in a deep way. In the early years of our school, when we were just starting, we didn't have that many children. We didn't have that many grown children. So sometimes some of us adults played parts. And in one of those plays, we, it was the life of Jesus, actually, and I played Mary. And the man who played uh, 
I think now the, the, actually the man who played Joseph was Ger uh, Brian's father, just incidentally. But uh, no, no, let me get this straight now. Yes, the man who plays Jesus is the one that was the important one I was saying. And he was a very, very good actor. And I think it was because of him that this happened. I was there and my, my Joseph had died. Usually in the Bible, they don't talk about Joseph dying, but we needed to create a little drama. So there's Brian's father in front of me and he's supposed to be Joseph and he's dead and I'm Mary. <laughs> But it was so interesting to me because something happened with the three of us on that stage. And I totally moved out of the present reality completely. And because um, my son, Jesus, as it were, was such a good actor, I was able to totally surrender to the part. And the, the way the scene went was I was uh, unwilling to leave my husband. And he literally had to pick me up and move me off. And it's very interesting to me because I, so vividly in my mind, I just decided to just do it. I just absolutely resisted. I forced him to just pick me up and move me, and I, didn't, I did nothing to help him. And just, I just moved into another reality. It was the only reality I, I had, just for a moment. But it was the only reality there was. I thought, oh my goodness, look at that. Just in the middle of this incarnation, I totally stepped into another. And if that incarnation had unfolded from that point, I would, I would not have remembered this one. Because I had just given myself to it so deeply. Of course, it was a, a, a poignant and a beautiful moment, but how many poignant and beautiful moments do we have? I mean, we're always saying, what if I don't remember? Well, we don't remember because we have given ourselves so completely to this moment that there's no room in our awareness for anything else. So the way the divine has structured this, and we can protest all we want, but nonetheless, this is where we are. Once we enter into this body, we become very engaged and identified. And we give ourselves wholeheartedly without resistance to this experience. Except the problem is this is not our whole reality. And we get glimpses of that every once in a while. Something happens and you can only say the veil cracks. Maybe you're out in nature somewhere. We were standing on the bridge of the Hut Falls, a uh, Hut Hookah, Hookah Falls. And you know the power of that water and the glory of that color. Just, you know, just for a minute, you just go into a completely other reality. I stood at uh, Deva Prayag on, uh, in, on the way to Badrinath in India, where these two rivers come together. And just, it was so much bigger than I was. Just, just for a moment, you completely forget. Your identity shifts into something else. Well, that's what we're working with all the time. We're deeply identified, but we are much more than this. And our superconscious understands, just as I was, all of you were here this morning, I was talking about we're learning how to love, aren't we? Last night I was talking about we're learning how to heal. We are, we are uninformed, we are informed only to a certain point. We have much more potential than we know, and we're pushed. We're pushed always to that. And what is the end point of that? I mean, the, every single physical body in the end dies. We all know it. And yet we, we still live in this kind of stiff concern that it might happen, that it might happen to one of us or someone we love. And this is Divine Mother saying to us, there's a whole other reality here, and whether you want to or not, you're going to learn it. So it's our choice. Do we go kicking and screaming to the inevitable, pretending the whole time that it's not going to happen like this? Or do we just say, of course, this is the way it always is. I mean, we were walking down the street just the other day, and there was a dead bird here, and there was a dead bird there. I mean, they're not attractive to look at, but well, that's what happens. If you live in another culture than the Western ones we live in, if you go to the city of... Varanasi, I mean, you're right on the river there, and there's the burning ghats right there, and you see people going through the streets with some, you know, my grandmother or my wife or my mother, and they're just carrying them in a little beer, and they're taking them down and burning them. And, you know, it's, why not? The only thing that makes us so nervous about this is a complete misunderstanding. 
So we just have to turn it around. We're all born to die, and we need to make the best of what we have in between, and we don't need to either fear it or, or be eager for it. It really doesn't help or hurt us either way. We don't gain anything when we die, any more than we gain anything when we change our clothes. If you're an unhappy person and you put on a different dress, you're still going to be an unhappy person. You're just going to be in a different dress. You know, if you're selfish and unloving, put on a new jacket, you're just going to be a selfish, unloving person wearing a new jacket. And when we're born into a new body and when we shed this body, what goes with us is the vibration of who we are. Who am I? What is real? Where does my happiness come from? How much do I love? And when we pass out of the, when our physical body is taken off, our spirit lightens up. Lightens up, not necessarily, it doesn't become more enlightened than it is, but apparently the physical body is really a burden. And far from being the great tool that we think it is, it deadens and dulls. That's why everyone who has a death experience and comes back always tells us how beautiful it is on the, on the other side. And how everything in this world is just so dull by comparison. And we think it's all so classy and so nice. But the, the burden of wearing a body uh, wears us out a little bit. So, however, having a physical body is a great and necessary opportunity. Because karma is the other part of this story. And karma is that collection of uh, unlearned lessons. In, in, and the, 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 the final exam is, who do I think I am? What, how do I define that I? Where do I think my happiness comes from? And how much do I love? And if I think I'm this body, this wife, this mother, this son, and I love those who are attached to me and defined with this body, and the only thing that's real is what I'm clinging to and can hold with my hands, then death is really a gruesome experience because you know, finger by finger, were ripped away from it. I, I, my father was in a, a care facility at the end of his life. So I was talking about him last night because his mind, he was, couldn't care for himself. He couldn't live on his own. And I was always a little bemused and never quite knew what to make of it. When you had these elderly people, and he was in a facility where all the people in his group uh, were, had some form of dementia. And they just still were trying to surround them with all the accoutrements of the life they've lived. This is your daughter and your daughter's husband and your daughter's cousin's husband and here are their children and here's their six grandchildren and here's the house and here's this and here's this. And I just loved the Indian system, the ideal Indian system, where at a certain stage of your life you say goodbye to it all and you just walk out into the woods. You just figure it's been a wonderful experience, but now it's time for me to take all the love that we've had together, but to release the form of it, especially my form, and just allow myself to remember that I am part of a greater whole. And this has just been the particular warp and woof of this experience. So uh, Master tells us repeatedly, he said, death itself is utterly painless. In fact, he said, death is the end of all pain, because we just step away from the very vehicle that causes us both emotional anguish and especially physical pain. He said the only thing that makes death painful is fear. Is the fear that somehow if we can't breathe through this body anymore, that somehow we'll cease to exist. Master put it in a way that I've always loved. He said, if people think, when I say Master, I mean Yogananda. When people think that their consciousness depends on their brain, when they feel the brain begin to die, they think they, they feel obligated to go unconscious. This is how he put it. But if you've done even a little bit of spiritual work and have understood that the brain is a vehicle for consciousness, not the cause of it, he said, when it begins to die, your spirit just rises above it in such a happy way. And all of a sudden you just realize, I never was that body. I've just, I just put it on as a part and just the theater is the perfect example. You put on this costume. And if you're a good actor or a good actress, you've got to wear it well. You can't just get up on the stage and say the whole time, this isn't me, this isn't me, this isn't me, this isn't me, really. Hello, come in, have a very good time here. You have to, 
You have to really do it. You don't get out of karma, Swami said to me once, by doing it badly. That was my, that was my program for a while, and it wasn't a good one. If I have to be here, I'll just, you know, I'll live a lousy life. I'll never accomplish anything, and that'll show how detached I am from this. No, 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 dear, that won't work. You have to give your whole heart to it, and then remember what's on the other side. As the scriptures, the Indian scriptures often say, you have to, um, you have to live in this world as if this was your last day, and then be content to live in it for a hundred years. Every day, just like, be ready. This is just the end. I always say it like, you try to stay karmically current. You know, we never really know. You all, I'm sure, have incidences in your life. I can give you a long list of people with sudden cancer diagnosis. Three weeks later, they're gone. Bicycle accident happened to a friend of mine recently. You know, now he's lying in a hospital bed. You just never know. One of my friends, her husband, he got up in the night to go into the bathroom, and he was stepping <coughs> from the bedroom to the bathroom, and instead he stepped into the astral world, just like that. He just was here, he was here, and then he was in the astral world. Every time I go into the bathroom at night, I think, well, I wonder where I'm going, <laughs> you know? <laughs> I wonder if I'm about to step out of my body. Now, that is not really a morbid thought. That's just an extremely realistic thought, isn't it? And it doesn't mean we don't want to be here. You know, we're in New Zealand right now, and I live in California. Every time I leave my house in California, I always uh, visualize coming back to it. I always sort of just, I'm going, this is a circle, I'll be in one place for a while and I'll always come back. And you know, maybe I will, maybe I won't. When I'm here, I don't really think about it very much and I don't identify with being there. I was talking to my husband on Skype and he was sitting in our living room and I'm looking at our living room. There's this beautiful picture of Krishna on the wall and I'm talking to him and I'm sort of looking at the background thinking, Wow, that's a lovely picture of Krishna. Oh, that's our living room. You know, just like that. We've lived there for years. It just crossed my mind. Oh, that's our living room, isn't it? That's where I usually live, but not now. So if I'm not living there now, why would I think about it? But then I know, and I'm certain of it, that on November 4th, and on this incredibly long November 4th, which is giving me back September 23rd, which it ate, you know, when I came here, it's all stuffed now into November 4th. I'll just, I'll just open that door and I'll be there again. And all of this wonderful experience will then be the dream. And something else will be real. You see, we're making this shift constantly, aren't we? Someone pulled up on the, a Facebook a picture of me from 1986. I think I look very different. She was kind enough to say I haven't changed that much, but I think she needs glasses. <laughs> but, okay. But I looked at the picture, and I remember it exactly. It was on a, I'm, I'm nearly certain it was the photograph that was taken on the first class train to Rishikesh in 1986 on our first trip to India. Because I, I recognize, I, I'm embarrassed to say it, I recognize the clothes I was wearing. Can you believe it? <laughs> There's a story about Dale Carnegie, who wrote this wonderful book, How to Win Friends and Influence People. It's a superb book. Don't be put off by the title. It's fabulous. And I'm just going to digress here. This is advice for husbands and wives. His Aunt Mildred is 97 years old. This is his story he's telling. She's dying. And, you know, her, her good friends, who are 93 and 94 respectively, all come to see her in her hospital bed. They have an old album and they're looking at pictures and they say, oh, here's us standing in front of the Washington Memorial, you know, 57 years ago when we took that trip to Washington, D.C. And Mil Aunt Mildred says, what was I wearing? <laughs> and they said, you know that polka dot dress with the red collar? Oh, yes, Mildred said, I remember that dress <laughs> 57 years before. And Dale Carnegie says, advice to husbands, never underestimate the importance of clothes to your wife. <laughs> That's his advice. <laughs> it's as simple as that. But the end point of all of that is, I remember that moment perfectly, but it's, it's not happening now. So how do we live? Do we live always in longing and regret for where we were? Do we live in... Uh, calm acceptance of the karma that has brought us right to this moment? 
do we live in joyful anticipation of what might come after? I mean, these are very simple questions, aren't they? But how we answer them determines not only our death, but our life, of course. Swami Kriyananda had two words, which are just such powerful words. I said them and I'll say them again here. He said the two realities that we have to watch for in life are the ones that make us have to come back. The first is longing, and the second is regret. And this is what makes the transition from life to life difficult, and this is the definition of karma. These are unlearned lessons. If God is equally present at all times, if everything that happens to us is for our ultimate well-being, if any difficulty we face is just an opportunity to expand our hearts and to learn to love on a deeper level and to identify more with the infinite and less with the finite, then why do we long for another reality and why do we regret the past? And all of the spiritual path can just become right to that. And we do long and we do regret. And that's the battlefield. I, I, someone wrote to me, I had written, I told some story and they watched it on the internet about this experience I had with Swami Kriyananda where just, I don't know, I don't know what made me do it, but I, he asked me to do one thing and I just utterly and completely in defiance of his wishes did something else. It was a trivial thing as it happened. But she wrote to me, she said, oh, I never would have recovered from that. I would still be worried about it. And I, I haven't answered her yet because I haven't really been able to think about how to put it into words. But regret, there it is. I did the best I could with the understanding I had how can I be upset for myself for not being something that I wasn't? You know, if now I know that it could have been more, but if I had known at the time, it would have been different, wouldn't it? You know, that's the battleground. And when we come into those final days of our life, if we don't just exit suddenly, if we don't get up at night and step from here to the astral world, but if we do it that way, we get to do it on the other side. Because sooner or later, we have to just survey the field. What am I still longing for? What do I regret? Now, there's two responses. One is to resolve it on the level of consciousness, just to understand it, if it didn't come to me, it wasn't meant to be. And if I behaved in a way that was unfortunate, if I had known better, I would have done better. We can resolve it on the level of consciousness, or we can get engaged in our life. That which I long for, let me pursue. That which I regret, let me make amends in so far as is possible. And then after that, let it be. Why wait? Why wait till we're trapped on our deathbeds? If you come to the film tonight, you'll hear me talking about a friend of mine named Paula and, and when she died. When she died, she spent the last three days in the hospital just resolving every Un, every piece of unfinished business. And she did it perfectly in this sense. She was completely honest with every, she didn't just try to make peace. Um, I don't say this in the movie, but there was one marvelous situation where 15 or 20 years earlier, she'd had to um, make a decision that had an impact on someone else. And that person was very angry about it and never really understood what had happened. But Paula had acted appropriately. But nonetheless, this disharmony remained for, for a long time. So Paula's on her deathbed, and she knows. So the woman's at a distance. She calls her up, and, and on the phone, this is what she said. I've always regretted that there has been disharmony between us. But I think we're both, she put it, big enough gals to put it behind us now, don't you think? She never even said, I'm sorry. She never said, I was wrong. She never said, I beg your forgiveness, because she wasn't wrong. And it was, in fact, up to the other woman to make peace with her. But she said it perfectly honestly. I've always regretted that there was disharmony between us. Because you can't fool your own karma. You can't just make it pretty, pretty. You have to be absolutely exactly what is true and have the courage just to stand in that. And that also means if I could have done better, I would have done better, you know, and I'm, I'm sorry that this happened. I wish it had been different. 
If I could have done it differently, I would have. If I had understood then what I understand now. Swami Kriyananda was always impeccably honest in everything he said. I wrote letters for him when I was his secretary. Sometimes I'd compose letters and sometimes he'd, he'd sign them as I wrote them. Sometimes he'd edit them. Somebody sent us some poetry and it was well-meaning, but it was not really great poetry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I just sort of fatuously wrote, thank you so much for sending your beautiful poetry. Swami said, it wasn't beautiful poetry. He said, it wasn't even really very nice poetry. <laughs> it was just their poetry. He said, what will you say when someone sends us beautiful poetry? Now that you have used up this word. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? I mean, but he was really training me. You don't, you can't fool karma. You can't just empty-headedly try to make it pretty. It just is what it is. So I wrote, to, and I composed a letter instead that said, I'm so happy to see that you're being creative in this way. <laughs> How nice of you to share your poetry. And of course, it was a very warm letter, and it was just what he meant to say. And we just didn't comment on the quality, because the quality wasn't important, and I didn't have something nice to say, so I wasn't going to say anything at all. Do you see? But this is what we have to work with. We can't say, oh, I don't care anymore. Oh, it doesn't matter. We have to just go right into the center of what is. And sometimes we just have to accept, which is really a lot of the time. Well, unfinished business. We'll see it again, won't we? And we also have to, again, also just work on our fear. Our fear of facing what has to be faced. You know, it's just, it's just going to come. A lot of karma is unfinished. This woman who was involved in the most complicated romantic situation, there was like, there were just, I guess there were just two men by that point, but two men and her and this just, ugh, it was just a mess. First time I met her, she says, I just want to finish this karma, so tell me how to finish this karma. I said, get another counselor. <laughs> you know, I can't help you finish this karma. You are in so deep, honey. We'll be lucky if we can just progress this an inch. You are not going to finish this. <laughs> you know, so a lot of times we just have to say, I did the best I could and so I get to see this one later. But we don't regret that it's not finished. We don't long for a reality that was other than that. It's just this is a continuing story and we're just going to work together on this. But the most important thing, the single most important thing about life and death is to always, as I was taught, calling it last night, always remember that we're going to the light and there's a happy ending. And whatever the ups and downs, you know, if you're climbing to the top of Mount Everest, you don't just start at the bottom and go like that, like up a straight slope, like a funicular that just goes. You go up and down and up and down and up and down. You lose sight of the mountain. You see it for a minute. You go into another valley. You make a right turn. And so at the same time, when you're climbing that mountain, you always know where you're going. You never think that you're on your way to Kathmandu. You're not. You're on your way to the top of Everest. And so part of right living and right dying is just to be really at peace. This is a long journey that I'm on. And actually, every step of the way is really quite interesting. Um, I, I've taken a lot of airplane flights in my life, and I really am not at all dismayed. I like long airplane flights. They're just kind of like a time out from life. And I get to watch all these really mostly very bad movies that I wouldn't spend any money to see otherwise, and you know, documentaries, and I have my little tiny world in my little tiny seat, and just this whole world. Why resist it? You know, what is the point of just sitting there in that, you know, moving metal bullet the whole time wishing you were somewhere else? It's just, it just has to be gone through. And so the more in our living and in our dying, we recognize, oh, this is an interesting process. Now I get to let go. And there's another part of this that I learned from a man named Stephen Levine, who's done a lot with living and dying. And this is how he put it, and I've always loved this. He said, because we are physically active beings, we are accustomed to taking whatever dissonance we feel in our consciousness and doing something about it physically. You know, I encouraged all of you, if you're feeling a little restless or sleepy, stand up and stretch. If we're feeling like it's a little stuffy, we'll open a window. If we're a little hungry, we'll go get something to eat. If we're a little lonely, we'll call a friend, we'll turn on our phones, whatever we're going to do. I have a friend who's been incarcerated in jail in California prison for all the time. I've known him 30-some years. And it's, the conditions in California prisons are not so terrific. 
and he lives in a very small cell with someone else, and he's locked in there. I mean, that's the whole point about prison. And, whoa, every time I start to complain about anything, I think about him, you know, just the thought. Let's open a window. It's stuffy in here. No, not quite. Not if you're in prison. I'm hungry. I want a piece of fruit. No, no, not if you're in prison. Use the telephone, call a friend, go out the door, zero, none. You know, and sometimes I use him as an image to try to just, you know, picture how would I cope? What would I do? Now, Stephen Levine puts this in terms of when we are finally, when the physical body is going away, and uh, if, if any of you have ever been with people in the process of dying, you, you're, you're, you die from the edges out. You're, you're, if you die slowly, your body gradually withdraws into the center. I'll talk about this in the second half. It dro withdraws into the center and you begin to lose, literally lose the capacity. You, just, you don't know where your arms are. You don't know where your feet are. You c go out of your body the same way you came into it. We, we came in from the medulla down the spine, so all the energy goes back. That's why uh, when someone's about to die, their feet get very cold. And in fact, if you're, if you're literally watching someone die, you will watch their body, the body paralyzes from the edge out. And then gradually you can just see that you see the breathing and then you watch the breathing move up and then it, it's gone. Just, they come out just exactly the way we came in. We came in through the medulla, down to the spine, we go up the spine and out. Most people fall back into the medulla, which is the ego self. And if we're very, if we're more spiritually aware, we go up through the spiritual eye. We make a choice there. And you, you, you can watch people do that. And so you see people, they just, uh, this woman that, she was dying of AIDS, I guess, and I went to see her a couple of days before. And, you know, she just like, she could still walk, but she just didn't know where this part of her body was, literally. Isn't that just, it's so odd when we think about it. So he says, you become trapped on the bed, Stephen's saying this, if you're on your deathbed. And your consciousness may still be just as active, but you don't have the capacity to alleviate the pressure by physical action. So as he put it, you have to solve the problems of consciousness purely on the level of consciousness, which is why many people in those last days become very, very agitated. Because all of that they are inside their head is still there, but they can no longer distract themselves from it. And this is where any kind of prayer meditation, centering, divine surrender, just serves you like nothing else. Because all of a sudden the body's not responding, but I am accustomed to existing purely on the level of consciousness. And it, it doesn't have to be, um, I mean it helps if, you, if you've literally trained, but people who have a positive relationship with God in any form also come into peace like that. Actually, as it happens, it was Paula's mother. Paula talked about her mother. Paula's the woman I talk about in the movie. Her mother was very devoted to the Virgin Mary. She was a very devoted Catholic, and she loved to do the rosary. Two of her three, two of her four children lived at Ananda, but those two children, when they went to her at her deathbed, they didn't try to talk about any one of these. They just sat and did the rosary with their mother because that's what she wanted. But at the end of her life, then she was a very sweet woman, the mother. Virgin Mary came to her and just at the end of the bed, and all of a sudden this woman who was very close to death sat up in bed and said, Hello, Mary! Hello, Mary! Just like that, just like a little girl. And it was just, that was how she had lived. Mary to her was her dearest friend, and all of a sudden Mary came, and she became like six years old, just no inhibition because that was who she was inside of herself. You see, you can't, you can't pretend. So if we have trained ourselves in, in all circumstances of our lives, no matter what we're doing, to always look upward, to always think in terms of light, to always see everything from just a little step backwards, instead of this determined I, you know, just to watch. Oh, this is, I've, I've said to others, I often enjoy the what I call the photo caption uh, uh, narration of my own life. Oh look, this is the part in which the heroine forgets everything and becomes really distressed. You know, this is the part in which tough karma almost destroys the heroine. This is the part in which the heroine finds herself and is able to go forward nobly. And it's a useful thing to do because the time's going to come 
when this costume's going to come off. And if we have just this little bit of practice, you know, I, I do this very public life. And I'm a, I'm a rather divided person. My, my private life, my private self is very different than my public self. And I often talk about the public self as she. I mean, I don't exaggerate it, but I am interested in the things she does. They seem quite unusual to me at times. And that's just the way it is. And it's very helpful within reason to always just realize this is just a part I'm playing. And, you know, it's nice if you play it well. It's better. It's less boring for the people who have to be with you, if nothing else. It's also less boring for you. And you're also much more likely to work out this karma if you really play the game. But always just remember she or he is just having this experience so that when it begins to fold up, you won't be so shocked or horrified. I had a dream, I'll tell you before we take a break. In this dream, it was time for me to die. This, I'm very proud of this dream. I, I like to tell this dream. I'm proud of my responses. In this dream, it was time for me to die. And I was going to die by being decapitated. And a good friend of mine, this man, this rather big man, he was going to decapitate me. And he had one of those ancient battle axes, you know, curved like that with a big handle like a cartoon battle axe. He had this gigantic battle axe. And there was this little, like, tree stump. And we were just chatting, and he was going to cut my head off. And that was, that was fine, because it, my head had to be cut off, and it was his job to cut it off. And, you know, I, the time came, I'm supposed to lay my head down, and he's going to pick up this big axe. And it was all quite cheerful. I was very detached from it. Just as the axe is about to come down, it crosses my mind that this might be painful. This hadn't really, hadn't really thought about that. And then I remembered what Yogananda said, is that when people are going to have a violent death, like that, the body, the soul will pull out just before the point of impact, which is, I'm sure if you've read, you know, life and return stories, a lot of times just that, the, the cars are crashing toward each other and then all of a sudden they're above it. So I'm just right here and just as the axe is coming down, it occurs to me that I don't have to wait. And so I exit and I start just sailing upward like this, just very, like, so free and so happy. And I, I can't see clearly what's happening to Asha, but I just wave, and, and just in this little voice, I just sort of like go down like that, and I say, Bye-bye, Asha! Just like that. <laughs> and that's, I just came in my subconscious, and I woke up, I was, as I said, I was so proud of myself. <laughs> but think about that, because you see, no matter when, no matter what, no matter what you try, no matter how assiduously you work against it, there will be that moment when you just look at what you were and you realize, I'm turning in the costume. You know, I'm back, I'm back at wardrobe, I'm turning in the costume. You know, and this was a really good one, I enjoyed this one. You know, and then you move over here to see what's next. But you just have to let it go. It doesn't work anymore, it's worn out. And really, every night before you go to sleep, every morning at the end of your meditation, Swami used to say, just as you're so assiduously washing your much beloved arm, just think of it being ashes. <laughs> just think of it just being gone. And my and I, I'm still there, but I'm just not wearing this costume anymore. Bye bye, whoever I've been. And with as little longing and regret, good story, great part you know, heroic actions, terrible tragedies, tough sections. But now it's just bye-bye, and let's see what we've learned, what we can carry, and where we can go from here. All right, let's take a break. All the Ananda music was sad. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I know we, I have a particular penchant for the poignant songs. It's, it, it's, let me try to think what it is. It awakens an internal longing is what it does. I mean, a lot of the songs are very much about longing, but the longing is for a kind of resolution of all longing. And, and before you can have that resolution, you have to long for it. And so a great deal of spiritual art is really to awaken a longing, because most people don't care. Uh, that's a, we're we're a, a lovely group in this room, but we're not a hundred people. We're not a thousand people in this room. Most people don't care. They're just off 
doing whatever they're going to do, and they're just longing to make the world. They're, as I was saying this morning, they're vaishas. They're making themselves happy by making their world just the way they want it to be. And it hasn't crossed their mind that what they need to do is to ascend into another dimension. So we do spend a lot of time on the spiritual path of just trying to touch the heart in a very different way. Um, I was speaking during the break, and this, this occurred to me that um, merely to have a profound and expanded understanding of the necessity and the nature of leaving this world does not make it less poignant. And, and true masters live in all levels of reality. You know, I was just in a little play, and in the play my husband has died and my son has to pull me away because I'm so grief-stricken I don't want to give it up. And I, you know, even just giving myself to that whole part, there was something just beautiful about it. Because the fact that we can care about each other so much, and we have these wonderful friendships, or even these horrible catastrophes, you know, of unresolved issues, or, or wasted lives where people never get it straightened out. It's, there's a, a, an exquisiteness to the progression of the soul. When Yogananda's closest woman disciple, her name was Sister Gyanamata, and, and she was uh, illuminated, she was completely freed in this life, he saw her spirit merge into the infinite. And yet, at her funeral, he wept. And he wept, he wept, how will I live without you, sister? How will I exist in this world if you're not here anymore? And your being here was always such a joy. It, it made this world different than it is. And now you're gone. And then he cried. And at the same time, he said he saw her spirit merge into the infinite. So we don't um, harden our hearts. In fact, our hearts become even more tender because we just recognize this is just a long journey with many stages. You know, the fact that I didn't even recognize my own living room when I'm talking to my husband, you know, it's not that I love him less. It's that as soon as the time is there, then that will be the reality again. And in between, we remember often with, and, and that's a different kind of longing. When Swamiji first told me this longing and regret, my first answer was, Swamiji, the first 10 years of building Ananda community from 24 to 34 in my life, I said, that was so much fun, I'd do it again in a heartbeat. And he said, oh, that's not the same. That's just rejoicing in something wonderful. That's not the same as that anguish, that unfulfilled anguish. So when you actually realize, and this is, this is the delicacy of it, see, sorrow comes from attachment. This is the only thing that will ever make me happy. And if I lose this, I'll be terribly unhappy. And we can't get over attachment by saying, I don't really care, because that's fear. What we have to do is we just have to give our hearts to it completely. One of Swami's songs, give life your heart, bless everything that's grown, fear not the loving, all this world's your own. And all this world's our own. This incarnation next. And what we also have to very deeply know is that all true love is forever. Maybe not mother, father, sister, brother, husband, <coughs> wife, mother, son, but the love that created that. What created mother, son? What created husband, wife? Was this great power of love <coughs> that found expression this way. And that is never lost. The form of it shifts because it has to progress. And this other part of it is how we... Um, so, so it's all right to, to, to grieve, it's all right to mourn, but we have to also be both realistic and unselfish. Because when a person takes off their body, they're taking it off because the costume doesn't fit anymore. In one way or another, that costume doesn't fit, either just because it's totally worn out. One of my friends whose mother was a farm woman from a very sort of desolate part of America, North Dakota farm woman, that woman, my friend's mother, as, her, as my friend said, she just lived on and on and on and on. And she said her mother was so frugal, she never discarded anything until she had squeezed the last bit of use out of it. And she saw her mother thinking, a few more heartbeats, a few more breaths, you know, not quite done. And so she just lived way longer than anyone expected her to. 
But sooner or later, the machine didn't work anymore and she had to give it up. Or the circumstances don't fit anymore. I mean, children die. The machine is fine, but circumstances are not serving their expanded consciousness. The last uh, question in the Ask Asha book, a woman wrote to me about having to put her Great Dane to sleep. And it was a complicated story and she felt extremely guilty and couldn't get over it. And I sympathize. She was very fortunate. You know, relationships with pets are very real. Sometimes they're some of the nicest love relationships we have. I said, but you know, the, the uh, spiritual potential of being a Great Dane is limited. Expanded by being your dog, but really, dogs are... Um, well, how much can they do? <laughs> you know, they can't read, they can't learn Kriya, they can't go to spiritual lectures, they can't, by their own decision, decide that I'm going to be a better, finer dog. They're just caught in this enjoyable, fun, but really, would you want to be a Great Dane forever? If you were a Great Dane, would you want to just stay there? There's just a certain point when I'm done being a dog. And there's a certain point when your mother's done being your mother, your son's done being your son, your husband's done being your husband, whatever it might be, just finished. It has nothing to do with you. Because, as I was saying this morning, we never own these people. They have their own destiny, remember? So, even though we want to enjoy the power of that love, we also have to be selfless in our love and realize it's time for you to go on. I, uh, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross has done, did a lot of work with hospice. She pioneered a lot of hospice. And there's one of the stories she tells about a little girl who was dying of leukemia or something. And it, she was ready to go. The child was ready to go. And they had done the whole thing as instructed. She'd been, her, her hospital bed was in the living room. And her, her, but her older brother was just really getting tired of it. You know, it's like day after day. His, his sister was just still in the living room. He was just ready to get on with it. And being just a child, he just said to his sister, you know, you're not going to get better. Why don't you just finish this? No, first he, he said it to Kubler-Ross. And then she said, say it to your sister. So he says to his sister, you know, are you ever going to die? Or are you just going to be in the living room forever? And she said, every night I pray to die. And every night mommy prays for me to live. She says, but if we both pray for me to die, maybe we can outpray mommy. <laughs> and so then Kubler Ross had them tell mommy. And so the two of them together said to mommy, look, I need to go. I'm finished. And so then she had to say, who am I loving here? Who am I helping? Where does this come from? And then she accepted, and a couple of days later, the little girl just went on. She was finished. She was not going to get better. She just needed to go. And then we have to have the balance of realizing that we're not being disloyal by just letting them go. And, and that's, that's often tricky. You know, that's often tricky. I remember a woman friend of mine whose husband died. You know, she said she began to just forget about him and live happy. And then she began to feel really guilty. And then, alternatively, if she wasn't grieving for him, he was really gone. You see how complicated it gets? But that's where we have to remember that what was ever was true about our relationship is always with us. Another friend whose husband died, she said, He's still with me. It's just a little less convenient to relate to him than it was when he was in his body. <laughs> she said, I was spoiled because it was really easy. I could relate to him all the time. Now it takes much more effort to be connected to him. She said, but he's still there. But we're not loving the people who are dying or have died by not accepting the necessity for them to go on. And when you're with people who, or when you're helping people die, you don't have to rush them. I had to learn that slowly. You know, we've been all right already. We've been here a long time. I have to go to work tomorrow. People die at the exact astrological moment. It's just like birth. It can't be rushed. You can't rush them. But at the same time, you need to be part of the fact that this is fine. And if it isn't fine, you need to do the best you can to be at peace with it. And if you have many regrets, then you have to try to put those at peace so as to not hold the person there. Yes? I don't know if you're going to address this, but over lunch we were talking about how it's real common for us to have a real apprehension about dying and just 
So were you going to talk a little bit about just what the dying process is like or what the astral world is like once we're there kind of thing? Um, in that book, Carmen Reincarnation, Master goes po step by step about what the experience of dying is. This is what I've observed. And this is a very important point to remember. Once you're getting ready to leave your body, see, people who are watching someone die, they don't understand the extent to which the consciousness has already left the body. And we, we watch someone die and experience it as if it was happening to me sitting in the chair right next to them. Um, there's a story told, this is a bit extreme, but it's interesting, about Edgar Cayce, who was a, 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 a seance, a trance mystic. He could do all kinds of readings. He'd go into these strange trances. But he also had, uh, he saw this world very differently than most people did. And there's this story told of him being in a building and a crowded elevator was there and he wanted to go down where the elevator was going. The doors opened and he started to step in, but just instinctively he stepped back. The doors closed, the cable broke, the car fell, and everyone in the car was killed. And he realized that their souls were largely absent from their bodies. And he was looking, there was almost no life force in that elevator because they were all just about to go and they were pulling away. Death is more gradual than some people realize. So oftentimes many things happen to the body, as one of my physician's friends said it. There's a kind of physical uh, reality, the struggle to breathe, the difficulty for the heartbeat, but the soul is not stupid. And it knows that it's just a little piece of it is left, which is part of why the body's not functioning so well. Because much of the body is already separated. And plus, even if, you know, it hurts a little bit, all of us have been through a little bit of hurt. And a little bit of pain is not such a horrid thing. It's a, a little bit like, I don't know, what, what could I say? You have a Band-Aid on and you have to pull it off. And you know it has to come off and there's that little bit of pain while it does. When I had my ears pierced, I was very cowardly. I was 30 before I had my ears pierced because I was such a chicken about having it done. And I finally watched babies get their ears pierced. And the babies went, ah! <laughs> <laughs> and I realized, hmm, that's not very much. <laughs> because, you know, babies make a big noise. They just made a single noise and that was it. And I, I've really realized that's a little bit of what it is when we're leaving our body. There's, there's a little anxiety because we don't know where we're going. But what you also have to realize that if you're present or even at a distance and you're praying, you're projecting light. There's this wonderful woman, uh, she wrote, uh, I can't remember the name of the book, but Angels of Something. And uh, she was a, a nurse and she often, she had psychic sight. And she, she would see the angel of death at, by the bedside of people and she always knew who was going to die because the angel of death was there. The, but the angel of death was not the scepter, specter like this. It was this beautiful angel of light. And in one case, she said, there was a man was dying or nearly had died and there was nobody by his bedside. And then a nun, it was a, it was a Catholic hospital, a nun went over and knelt in front of a statue and started praying for that man. Immediately an angel came, just like that. So you must never underestimate the power of your devotion in your prayer. It's the best possible karma for someone to have someone there who believes in the power of light. And, and it's so helpful to people who are dying for you to be there projecting to them. And the, the best and the single thing to say is, follow the light. You don't have to have a creed. You don't have to have a religion. You know, people will relate the way they relate. Paula's mother saw the Virgin Mary. There was no point in talking to her about Babaji and Sri Yukteswar. I mean, uh, uh, someone wrote to Stephen Levine, my Jewish grandmother is dying in a Hebrew home in Brooklyn. I want to sit by the side of her bed and read her the Tibetan Book of the Dead. He said, why don't you sit with her and sing Yiddish love songs? <laughs> he said, that's what she'll understand. You know, just be with her in her spirit. Because what you say doesn't make any difference. And what image of light people see is just according to their, their brain's predisposition. But light is light. It doesn't make any difference. And I was saying this, I, I remember now, in a different class I gave, the single most powerful thing you can do for someone when they're dying is not to be afraid. 
just, this is inevitable, this is going to happen. You're going on a great adventure, you know, mom, dad, you know, you've done a great job. You've been a fabulous parent or you did the best you could and now you get to take off that costume which isn't working so well and you get to just go, just follow the light, just follow the light. Just think about the light and follow the light. We have a recording over here of, of Om, Swami Kriyananda chanting Om. We have another one of him chanting Sanskrit mantras. If you can put into the room, hearing is the last sound to go, if you can put into the room of someone who's dying, some just very calm, transitional. The Om is the transitional into the spirit. Those, those Sanskrit mantras are the transition into the spirit or just, you know, very uplifted, calm, and, and something with courage in it. You don't want something that's jazzy and that's reminding them of all the sensual world and everything that they're... You want something that's just taking them right out like that. And I've been in a number of, of um, death watches and we've played usually the Om or the Gayatri Mantra, and everybody, doctors, nurses who don't know zilch about what we're doing, they just say, oh, it's just so calm in here. And then above all, you just keep that open-hearted, you know. It's just, I, when my father was dying, and just, he was a great daddy to me. Thank you, daddy, for all that you did for me. I really enjoyed now. You've just done a great job. Just go on. Just let go and go on. And it just felt like such a, uh, a gift. That's how you repay them. And then afterwards, even if you're crying, that's appreciation. Oh, it's just been so beautiful, I'll miss you. But it, it has to be repeatedly, thank you, thank you, thank you. There's a, I mean, and, and if we grieve too much, we cause the people in the astral world a real problem. They really have to push us away, or our grief literally holds them. And it can hold them. So we, don't, we mustn't think that we're doing a great service by showing how much we loved people. The example that I've shared before was we were in Assisi, Italy, and right on the road there to our community, there's this shrine, you know, one of those highway shrines, and always had fresh flowers. And they told Swami that, you know, three years earlier, a young man had been killed on that spot. Three years later, his mother kept fresh flowers there every day. Now, on one hand, you think, oh, what devotion. Swami said, what a burden to that poor soul that he was finished, he needed to go on. And now every day, his mother reminds him from the ast in the astral world how miserable she is, how much she misses him. How, how are, is that love? And also, what a, a complete um, disrespect of the divine plan. You know, there is no plan but my desire. You have no reality but what I want from you. You see, we have to be very careful of that. It's very, very important. And then we can be such friends. I, uh, I wanted uh, to make a, a service through our community. We haven't, it's never really worked, where we would be, I called us midwives of death or something like that. I actually wanted to call us angels of death, which people told me, people told me that was bad marketing. <laughs> yeah, I haven't, that one really has gotten no traction. <laughs> but to me, you know, I'm a little odd. It seems like a really nice thing for me, to me, but nobody wants it. But I feel like, as students of self-realization, and we have been called upon in many circumstances to help, we can really help. Because it's nice if somebody in the room is not afraid. It's nice if somebody in the room has some idea of what's happening, where they're going. And, you know, and can just, you know, watch the spirit, as I was saying. We come into the body through the medulla. This is what Yogananda says. Sperm and ovum unite. The first cell in the human body is at the medulla. This is the seed uh, source of life. You can't operate on this part of the body. It just can't be touched. And then the next thing that happens is we make the spine. This is the chakras and the karma. This is not the class I'm giving, but this is how it works. And this is, this is the definition of how much body you need. A person can be a worm. But if you, if you have the head to the base of the spine, you're a living human being. You can lose all your limbs, but you can't lose more than that. Because if you lose more than that, that's, your, that's the chakras. That's the place, so to speak, where the chakras reside. And w when we uh, make our bodies, we go out and downward, out, I mean, down to the base of the spine, to the earth chakra, and then outward through each of the chakras to make the arms, to make the legs, the digestive system, the heart, everything like that. From the moment we're born, what are we doing? We're all reaching outward, aren't we? And that's, that's what it is, to incarnate. We reach, we grab, we look, we live through our senses. And when we die, 
all of that has to withdraw. And the degree to which, as I was saying earlier, we have no sense of reality except that, that's the degree to which it's difficult. But if we just say, well, it's been a good run, and now I, I can't feel my hands, and now I can't feel my feet, and that's why when we meditate, we meditate in the spine, at the spiritual eye, because we're practicing. In St. Paul in the Bible says, I die daily, is what he said. And he, he meant literally, he just withdraws his energy from his body and then lives in the spirit. And if we have done the right kind of, let's say the, the, the most useful kind of meditation for this purpose, we sit and we meditate, we literally, we draw our energy up into the spine and we run it up and down the spine. And that's what happens when we die. We just become more and more of the internal energy. And then the last point is here, which is, this is one chakra. This is the chakra of individual identity, is what you would call it. And when we are the, the spirit, identified with the physical body, our, our consciousness resides at the medulla. And this is where most of us live. This is why if you're really stressed and tense, you'll feel that you've got all this energy right up here. And you know, if somebody massages and releases that, you feel so much better. The universal sign of humility is a bow, because we release the tension here. I was in India once, and it was about 110 degrees. It was very, very hot. And I was getting really anxious about it. And I put ice on my medulla. And it was still 110 degrees, but I was no longer anxious about it. I just sort of calmed down the ego part of me, part that was so identified with the experience. As long as I kept ice here, I could stand the heat perfectly well. Somebody's proud. They look down their nose like this, right? And when we're meditating, we meditate, we concentrate at the spiritual eye, the way Kriya Yoga is taught, our course in meditation, because we're literally trying to change our sense of identification from the physical body to the spiritual body. And the degree to which we have become accustomed to centering ourselves here really becomes relevant when the energy tries to leave the body. And, and as I'll talk tomorrow afternoon when I teach meditation, when you meditate, you bring all the energy into a focus like this, but then you intensify that energy and expand it. Because we, we bring all the energy in when we fall asleep, but we diminish it and contract it, and we literally fall backwards and go to sleep. You know, that's just what we do. We fall into the, uh, the sense of self and we fall asleep there. But if at that point we intensify it, then we go up into the spirit. So when people are dying, most people, the energy comes to here, and it gets to here, and then they just collapse, and they, they fall into death. But if you are at all a spiritual person and have trained yourself, you can rise into death. When I talk about Paula in the movie, that's what I'm talking about. She brought her energy consciously up and then went out very consciously. And if you're helping someone die, you can literally just, you know, even touch them here. Yogananda uh, said sometimes he put the hand on the medulla and the hand on the forehead, just kind of encouraging that energy to move. You can help people just kind of bring the energy up the spine and keep, try to keep the focus of energy here. You can just concentrate without touching someone, just concentrate on what's on right here, and you can help them enormously. Just pull them toward that. Just let everything go. Just follow the light. Don't worry. Be happy. You have no idea. You can help so much. It's a very delicate moment. Okay, yes? What if, where, can you uh, comment on where we go? Which is a question my mother asked when she was... Where do we go? You, you, you merge into a vibratory universe that matches your vibration. And people talk about that as heaven or hell, but when we are no longer material, we are a pattern of energy. And that pattern of energy is the sum total of all the karma in the chakras, which is the sum total of everything that we've ever been ever and the end of this life. If we've been a good, honorable person, we have an essentially positive vibration. And when we're in the material world, everything is all mixed up. Good and evil people are all together. In the vibratory world, which is the astral world, which is the energy world, um, because it's vibrations, only similar vibrations can be together. Does that make sense? So you simply, you go right into whatever vibration is your vibration. 
And it's not what you think you are or what other people think you are or who you've pretended to be. It is just simply who you are on the scale between evil, selfish, and divinely enlightened. And good people go to good places. But evil people go to evil places because that's their essential vibration. And I don't mean good people who make mistakes. I mean people who have tried to hurt others and have actively worked against goodness. There is hell, and most of the death and return stories are all these beautiful light stories, but there's a number of them that are very interesting of people whose vibration was dark and they just went into darkness and fortunately they came back and were able to repent before they had to go there again but it's a very important part of it so you can't fake that and that's the other reason why this morning when I was talking about loving people opening our hearts forgiving learning what we have to learn because that is the sum total of our vibration and we just merge into whatever vibration is our truth. And if we've lived a pious, good, as best we can life, we merge into a world where beings of light welcome us and try to help us move forward. And it's very familiar to us because it's our own reality. That's part of it, you see. We merge, it's our own consciousness that we're experiencing. So it's not like we suddenly flip over into some place that we've never seen before. We just are freed from like a corset of the physical body and, and if your body's been sick for a long time, for example, all of a sudden all that pain and heaviness is gone. And it's just, it's a worn out garment. It's like if you wore a wool coat out in this rain and then that coat got soaked with rain and you had to just keep walking around in this heavy wool rain soaked coat and then suddenly you got to take it off and the sun was shining. Just think how free you'd feel. Everyone who takes off their body, that's how they feel. It's like they suddenly got to take off this itchy, heavy garment they didn't even know they had on. And then whatever your essential nature is, is what you get to experience. And, you can, and in the moment of death, it, it, the shift is important. That's why you can help. Because people, what happens is you see it's a bit of a, a tug of war between the upward moving aspiration and the egoic habit. And the egoic habit of, oh, I've been such a bad person. There were so many things I didn't do. No, you've been, lived a wonderful life. You can go into the light. And it really helps people to be able to just let go and move forward. It's very delicate moments like that. So you go to yourself, you go to your own world, into a place you recognize, and everybody, all your, all your astral friends who are not incarnated in the physical world say, there you are, where have you been? <laughs> Yogananda said, birth in the physical world is a celebration and a funeral in the astral world. Death is a funeral in the physical world and a birth in the astral world. <laughs> And that's what people talk about. They see all the people that they love. Even if those people have reincarnated, they leave the, a vibration of that is still there for you. And so you're reunited. That's why people are so, they see their, you know, their husbands, their wives, whatever, whoever they love. They, they see, they seem to see their pets too. I mean, it's most fascinating because love is never lost. And then in the astral world, you gradually understand spirit instead of form. But form is there to help you transition. And they have an astral hospital, as I understand it. So if you're not really, my mother, when she died, she didn't really know that she wasn't sick because she'd been sick for so long. And, and I dream, my first dream of her, she was in the astral hospital. And she just didn't really know that she was okay. It took a little while before my, a series of dreams before she finally was young and free. But at first, she, she, she had to go to the astral hospital, and they had to just tell her that she was okay now. Really, I mean, I think it's the truth. I, I, that's how Master describes it, and that's how I dreamed her, and it just seemed so exact. She was just so, she'd been sick for so long, she just couldn't shed it quite right away. Took her, and besides, she's very stubborn and not easily influenced. So I think they were all trying to tell her that she was well, and she said, I don't think so. <laughs> it was, yeah, that's right. That's exactly right. I can just see her. I'm not sure about that. <laughs> she called me into the astral world in my dream, you know, trying to get me on her side. No, Mama, I think it's okay. These people will take care of you. you know, she was wanting me to perpetuate her point of view, which was how we lived when we were in this world, too. <laughs> it was so darling. I was really touched by it. Yeah. Well, any other questions or thoughts before we... Yes. 
what, what do you think happens, like you talk about um, ascending from there and uh-huh. falling back from the medulla, right. but what, what do you think happens when people have been sick for a long time, maybe something like cancer, and it's really painful and it's slow and it's long and they've had a lot of drugs and morphine and it goes on for months. What do you think happens, like... I mean, ideally, you wouldn't want to be having any drugs when you transition, but what do you think happens? It's better if you're not, but bear in mind, there's a difference between the brain and the consciousness. Mm. And drugs are merely physical, and they merely affect the physical body. They do not affect the soul. Souls are untouched by it. And uh, sometimes the physical pain is, even Paula, who died heroically, she was really keen on the morphine because there was a lot of pain there. She really liked the morphine, and she knew just when the morphine was coming. <laughs> and so she had both morphine and a very clear mind simultaneously. You know, a long, slow transition, we think of it as terrible. It's not necessarily so terrible. For one thing, you can work out a lot of karma on your body. Just a lot of uh, unresolved issues can fight themselves out physically. Cancer works out a lot of karma. It may not be pleasant, but you can also develop a lot of courage. You can overcome a lot of fear. You can resolve a lot of unresolved issues. We don't really know what a person is doing. We just look at it and say, oh, that looks unpleasant. But we don't know what the soul is doing, and we have to have a deeper trust that the superconscious has brought you to that position because that's just exactly what you need. And then once it's over, it's over. And any fear we have of necessary karmic conditions is going to diminish our capacity and other people's capacity to learn. And if such a situation is brought to us, my mother had Parkinson's for 15 years. That is one heck of a cycle. Believe me, it was really something to watch. 12 years into it, she said, I hate to admit it, was her phrase. I hate to admit it, but this has been the making of me. And it was. She just developed a strength of character, of willpower, of uh, self-reliance, determination. I can make a huge list of virtues that she did not have when she was diagnosed. But toward the end, that's what she got. So you just don't know. That's why it's really not good to panic and help someone transition before the body is ready to let go. At the same time, when the body's ready to let go, let it go. They don't have to keep pumping it up and putting tubes into it and feeding it when it doesn't want to eat anymore. Just leave it alone and let it pass. But if it takes a while to let it pass, it's because, because it's still serving the, the consciousness of the person in there. It's still doing something for them that they need because the second that it no longer serves their consciousness, they will leave that, no matter what. And if they haven't, it's because they're not ready to go. And that's also the courage that we have to have. We have to have courage for people to be able, I was saying this last night, to be able to go through their own karma. We can't be afraid of their karma. You're not helping someone if you're panicked over what they have to do. I mean, think about that. They have to do it, and they know they have to do it, and you're so panicked. That's a lot of times why people die when all the family finally leaves them alone. You know, people feel so guilty. I was with my mother all the time. I stepped outside for just a minute and she died then. And then they torture themselves. Often it's because they, they can't leave while you're there holding them. They have to wait till there's a moment. And if they're going through a very difficult cycle, the more calmly you can just support them in it. You know, I don't know what you're doing. I'm not sure why you're doing this, but I'm here. I'll just stay with you until this is done. Uh, a friend of mine, he died of cancer, and my friend went down to help him die, and his wife was also there. And my friend had a very deep, has a very deep spiritual nature. His wife, the wife of the dying man, was a good woman, but she didn't have the same understanding, and she knew it. In the literally the last moments of this man's life, his wife was on one side and his friend was on the other. He looked at his wife, he looked at his friend, his, he kept going like that back and forth. Then his eyes split, and he looked at both of them, at which point the wife said, I think I'm just going to go to sleep. And she curled up next to him in bed, and she turned to my friend and says, you take him. And then she curled up next to him. The man looked at my friend, and eye to eye, and he exited like that. It was a long cancer death. 
lung cancer death. Why but do you think that was? Because she was the world in attachment and he was not afraid to let him go. Mm. Okay. And she knew he had to die, but she loved him too much, so she just curled up next to him. Mm. And the and other she, one, he was okay. And, but he was okay because that. he had the understanding to let it to take him across. I mean, there's just, it's, it, it's, the stories are thrilling when you get close to them. And if you can be part of any of them, it's wonderful. If you can be an angel of death. <laughs> be an angel for death, an angel at death. It's a great service. Yes? Um, I've got, sorry, how do you explain to someone um, that someone has passed away, that they haven't let go even now, it's been almost over four years, and they're still, every day they live is as if that, you know, the person is still alive. How do you explain to them that they're not ready to listen? Like, and it's painful just watching them what they're going through in terms of they haven't come into terms with it has happened. Um, whereas for and they when they talk about it, it's still in present tense. So how do you do that when someone's not ready to face that? Like, what what do you do? Because you want to help them out because you want them to come into terms with you know it's happened and you have to deal with it and it's it's making the soul suffer and it's not you know letting it go kind of thing so nobody ever learns from being told until they're ready to be told yeah so I mean, start like, there so how long do you wait or how long no 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 listen to me <laughs> <laughs> nobody learns from being told until they're ready to be told do not waste your energy thinking you can force a person to a realization they're not ready to and the more you say to someone what they don't want to hear, the more they will push you out. And the more they will block the message entirely and almost stubbornly cling because you force them to defend their position. So the only possible way you can help them is by silence and by, by a positive vibrations. You know, and a, this is from last night, a true, loving, supportive, compassionate understanding and holding an image of the day will come when you will be able to rise above that. But until then, I'm just going to try to help you. And then you pray. I would pray to Divine Mother. Could you please help this person learn whatever it is? And don't tell Divine Mother what it is. Yeah, yeah. Write this down, this is the one. <laughs> okay. You must pray to Divine Mother Whatever it is, it's in, you know where it is? It's in the Ask Asha book. No. Okay, wh wh whatever it is that she's supposed to learn, and don't, as I said, don't tell Divine Mother what they're supposed to learn, because you don't know. Whatever it is that this person is supposed to learn, give them the wisdom, the receptivity, the humility, and the devotion to learn it. And pray that every day, and pray that when you're standing in front of them and they're behaving in the way that you wish they would stop, even as they stand in front of you and you're nodding your head, you say, Divine Mother, would you please help this person to learn what they're trying to learn? If you pray that every day, that will have more effect than all the talking that you can do. Now, here's two more parts. Pray to the person's superconscious. You know, could you, you know, whatever it is you're trying to learn, how can I help you learn it? And that's a question. How can I help you learn it? And if no true inspiration comes to you, keep your mouth shut. But you'll be surprised what will occur to you to say. And the third thing is pray to the person who's departed. And say, your mother, your sister, whoever you're talking about, is so miserable. What can we do to help her? How can I help you help her? And do all of that in lieu of trying to persuade them. And the self-discipline required, all that energy that you're having go forward, you have to use it to stand here in perfect faith that this is unfolding as it has to unfold. So this is not passive. People think if I'm not trying to persuade someone, I'm doing nothing. No, no. You're using all your energy to stand absolutely still. And just hold that stillness, hold your attention here, and hold that prayer. And that will really change them. All of your nagging won't. Yeah, and I, <laughs> and we haven't said anything till now. Like, but it, every time when you watch that person, it worries you. And but not even once have we mentioned that you know, let it go. Like, 
But you, but you really, listen. Yeah. People, but read your, people read your mind. <laughs> you think just because your mouth is shut, they don't read your mind? People read your mind. No, so you have to get it out of your mind, too. All this anxiety, I want her to be different, I'm worried. You have to just, this is in Divine Mother's hands, and take your anxiety and, and use it in prayer. Divine Mother, you have to help them, and use all that energy every time you're worried. Divine Mother, help this person. Repeat it like a mantra, just over and over and over again. It has a transforming effect on everybody, because you're relaxed, and you're in tune with the higher power, and you're actually using your energy in a constructive manner. I did this for my parents. I believe it changed them enormously. It certainly changed me. It just changed me from worried, anxious, to just very, it's all right. Whatever this is, however long it takes, we're just going to go through it. And then when the moment came, I must add, my mother, the Parkinson's, went to her brain and she started having seizures, which is really, really unattractive for her at the end. I mean, unattractive in the sense of tough. And we were in the, we were in the emergency room. Mother was a small woman anyway, but she was really small. And for some reason, we were in a, a space that was almost as big as this room. I don't know why, just with curtains around us. And my mom was all curled up. She was asleep now after the seizure. She was asleep in the bed. And I just thought, now is the time. And I, I visualized all the masters. And I sort of had them in, there were a lot of chairs. In, I had them in chairs around the room. And this is what I actually said. I've been working for you guys a long time, and I need a favor. <laughs> I just, it was over for me. I said, you know, this is enough. You can't put her through this. You know, she's been courageous, and it's been worthwhile, but now it's, now it's done. She died about a week later. I had just left the country. I was in Rome, my, and my sister called up and like this. She said, Mom died this morning. I said, Good for her. I just that was the words that came out of my mouth, which is wonderful. You know, it, it was enough. But but because I had restrained myself, when I really knew that it was finished, I was able to be just completely clean. This is enough. You know, let me. I'm going to cash in my karma chips here. You know, get this poor woman out of her body. It's just too much. If if God hadn't answered that prayer, I would have just accepted it. But it was a, a great comfort to me that he did. Yeah. Did you say a few words about suicide? Oh, suicide. Oh, my goodness. A suicide is just action. It's just karma. It's just an unlearned lesson. It's a tough one because you have, uh, you have completely abdicated your willingness to face. And you have taken, the, the biggest problem with suicide, the biggest problem is that it, it gains you nothing. It causes a lot of grief around you. It interrupts the progress of where you're going. It is the result of some real challenge that you have to face. And it absolutely progresses you not at all. So that's a very just kind of simple, neutral way to say it. It simply doesn't work. Is there bad karma for all the grief that you cause people when you well, it activates a lot of other causes that eventually all have to be faced. So it gains you nothing. It just puts you in an even more complicated situation that's then just going to have to be worked out. And there's a very interesting book, the name of which I can't remember, but a woman tried to kill herself. It was a death and return story, but it was a suicide death. And she went to the place where suicides hang out. And, okay, the nature of a suicide, I mean, you just go to your vibration. What's the nature of a suicide? It's absolute life-negating despair. So she was in this very, you know, misty, dark place, and a whole bunch of people were sitting like this. And the way she described it, judging from their clothes, a lot of them had been there for a really long time. And they, they were just experiencing their vibration, and their vibration was of life-negating um, unwillingness, to deal with it. And what happened to her, very interesting story. She said, she wasn't a church-going person, but she's there. She suddenly realizes where she is and she does not want to be there. And the word Jesus came to her mind. She was not a particularly a Christian or anything, but a concept with light into that darkness because the suicide has lost all hope. 
But the word Jesus came to her mind. When the word Jesus came to her mind, this is what she did. She lifted her eyes. And when she lifted her eyes, she saw that there were hundreds of angels hovering above this place, trying to get these souls to lift their eyes. And as soon as she lifted her eyes and saw the angel, she was drawn up into the light. Yes. So if you know people that have committed suicide and they could be in there, there mm -hmm. could you pray for them to look up? Exactly. Pray for them to believe in the light, accept the light, follow the light. And again, Divine Mother, whatever it is he needs to learn, she needs to learn. But you see, whatever the fear of facing what they had to do and rising to the challenge of their own unlearned lessons, it still has to be faced. So the way the karma of suicide has been described to me is that you just get to play the whole story out again. I mean, not necessarily in literal terms, but you get to be pushed to the same point and then have the courage to go on. See, which is what the problem is, is you escape nothing. And suicide also becomes a habit, karmic habit. I have a friend who told me that, you know, every time anything goes wrong, she immediately thinks of throwing herself off the balcony. And we were just having a conversation about some difficulty in her life, and she said, I have an urge right now to just run into the other room. We're on the second floor and throw myself off the balcony. It's just, and another woman came to me, and she confessed to me, I mean, I'm so glad she did, that she constantly thought of killing herself. Not even, not not that seriously, but it was just always in her mind that, that I'll just solve this by killing myself. And I told her, well, it's a karmic habit. You know, you've obviously done it a lot of times, and so you keep thinking that it's a way to go. Just like if you were addicted to drinking or drugs or, or sugar or anything else that you have an inclination to do that you know is not wholesome and you don't want to do it, still you have to fight the pull. And so people suffer. But it also depends a lot on the context in which you kill yourself. Some people are out of their minds, you know, and they're really not responsible. Some do it in a drug-induced uh, psychosis. Some people do it out of anger to get back at everyone. That would be the worst. You know, and some are just sensitive people who've been hurt too much. There's many, many dimensions. It's not just one reality. But it's all about unlearned lessons that eventually have to be faced. So what you want to tell the person is you can do it. It's not so bad. With God's help and all of our love for you. And then, of course, all the, the grief that you cause, yeah, that rebounds back on you too. So it's just a mess. But it's just karma. It's just karma. And all karma eventually resolves. So it's not a good idea, but, you know, there it is. It will figure itself out. And compared to eternity, all time is short. And when it's resolved, it's resolved forever. And when you've really learned it, you will never unlearn it. That's how you have courage in the face of these things. Yes? In case of suicide, so what is the transition into the astral plane? Well, they, they shed their body and they go into their own vibration. And because suicide is such a dark, life-negating, I can't face it, I don't care what happens, or I don't care who's hurt, I'm just going to go there, that's not a very high vibration. However, you see, it depends. It also depends on the moment of death, what they think. I mean, there's just many, many factors there that can all be influenced and then influenced later. Because eventually they will learn it. Because everybody learns, eventually. Because suicide doesn't work. And the things that don't work, we gradually realize they don't work. It's an untimely death. It's an untimely death. They tell people back, but here they have determined they did. Yeah, and that's why it's unfortunate. It's not a wise action, but even though one should be serious about trying to help such people, one should also not become too upset. You just have this calm, well, that wasn't the best choice, let's try to make a better one. Because we've had millions of incarnations, so taking off a body in itself is not such a big deal. Being that afraid to face your karma, that's the problem. And yeah, it's painful for everybody. It's very, I mean, life breaks your heart. And life breaks your heart over and over and over again so that you will begin to look for a higher solution. I'm going to tell you one more story about death and then we'll stop. Um, 
a, a friend of mine died. Um, she was about my age. It was considered untimely. It was a freak illness, and she was sick for a while, but then she died. Um, we went to the funeral. Um, in the context, the, the religious context in which they were, the funeral took place, very prominent family, very well-to-do family, hundreds of people there, and they had no idea what death was, absolutely none, and everybody in the room was totally freaked that this woman had died. David and I are sitting there, it's like, oh, I wish I could have the microphone, you know, just for a minute. There's so much I could say that could help, but there wasn't a chance. It just wasn't, nobody respected us for what we could offer. So we just had to live through this, and the family was miserable, and the people were miserable, and I was just totally, I was beginning to come a little unhinged because it was just the grief. I mean, this was recent. The grief was so intense. But then, oh, I remembered, oh, this is what happens to us that wakes us up. These are the experiences that wake us up, that make us think there has to be a higher reality. There has to be something else going on than just this, this absolute misery. And this kind of misery is what causes us to think. It, what I was talking to you all last night is what caused me to be born at the age of 10, thinking, ah, this is not the whole story. I know there's another story back here. And that was because of all those experiences. Is this really life? And many people will just say it is. And all those hundreds of people, we just had to mourn this horrible tragedy and give money for medical research so nobody else would die. Really? Is that the only thing we can do? No. We can live from a greater reality. We can understand that we're playing parts in a play, everything I've been saying for all these days here. And I just, all of a sudden, it, you know, I, I wasn't affected anymore. I was able to be much more kind and compassionate because I was, you know, in a weird way, I was happy they were suffering because you're so amazingly superficial, <laughs> you know? Maybe this will cause you to become a little deeper. And that would be all to the good, wouldn't it? That's how Swamiji would, would, would deal with people who were suffering. He would think, oh, how sweet it will be when you finally realize the divine behind this. And their very misery for him was cause for joy, because how much sweeter then will be the relief. And that was exactly what I was. I'm so happy you're so miserable, because really nothing else could have woken you up. You're so materialistic. You're so blind. And, you know, people I love, but wow, you are so materialistic and you are so blind. I wouldn't have orchestrated this, but since somebody else did, I'm so happy for you. You see how peculiar it is once you change your perspective? Okay. Any other questions? The suicide is like that. I did a funeral for a suicide. The young, a young man, his picture is up here. In the middle of it, his father rushed out of the room and didn't come back. I thought, oh my gosh, you know, poor fellow. What had happened was his son, the picture started to move, and it said, don't worry, Dad, I'm okay. Mm. His father was so freaked out he ran away. I think he went and got a drink, actually. What the picture said? The picture said, I mean, I didn't hear it. The picture oh, of the okay. boy is right here, and the picture says to his father, don't worry, Dad, I'm okay. So actually he did. He ran out and he got a beer. The father, he just didn't know what to do. <laughs> but of course... There you have it. Something completely other had happened. Yeah. Thank God. Okay. I think that might be the end of the story, except I have here for you this beautiful poem, which we call the, we call it the Astral Ascension. And it's a, it's a goodbye poem. And we read it at every funeral service, and feel free to use it. There's nothing proprietary about it. It's really beautiful. And it also gives you just the right attitude toward your death, the death of people around you, and anybody in your life who has died or may die, you can, read, you can read this over their body just after they pass. You can read this at a funeral service. Uh, it's really a wonderful. And we have this song. <laughs> Dunbar had this idea that he would sing for you. We have a goodbye song, which we generally use when human beings living leave each other. <laughs> but it's also a beautiful song for a funeral. So he thought he would just sing it for now on, on both notes. Okay. Joyful blessings speed you safely on your way. May God's light expand within you. May 
May we be one in that light someday. Go with love, may joyful blessings speed you safely on your way. May God's light expand within you. May we be one in that light someday. May we be one in that light someday. When we've had to say goodbye to people sometimes, we have a funeral service. We read this prayer. I mean, we did this many times, you know, and then it was somebody's beautiful picture up there and you have rose petals and everybody just sings that song and throws rose petals. You know, the funeral services can be really important because everybody's energy gets to come together. But you want it to come together in just the right way. You know, you don't want to be walking lugubriously in black. It's very tiresome. <laughs> but, you know, it's a moment. You can't just pretend it isn't. But you want to have just the right spirit and that song always touches it just right.